This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. This is Rebecca Kesby with NewsHour, recorded on Saturday the 14th at 14 hours GMT. Coming up, just nine hours to go before a ceasefire is meant to begin in eastern Ukraine, but the fighting continues and civilians are caught in the crossfire. Most people here never really supported the separatist movement and they never really wanted to join Russia. They just want everything to end. Also today, a terrible dust storm across western Iran causes chaos, but are failures in government management as much the problem as the weather? All the environmental aspects have been overlooked and now we're seeing the consequences. And the consequences show themselves when there is an extreme event. And Boko Haram attacks another Nigerian city. We'll get the latest from Gombe. You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Rebecca Kesby with NewsHour. That's the sound of a man selling face masks. He's uh, saying that the air is polluted. And that's because for the past 10 days or so, people in western Iran have been suffering one of the worst dust storms in recent times. Schools and businesses in Khuzestan have been forced to close. Local people have been advised to stay indoors and to wear face masks. There have been emergency meetings in the capital, Tehran, on what to do about the crisis. And while the dry weather hasn't helped the situation, many are blaming other factors that have contributed to this and other environmental problems in Iran. Some people have even been taken to the streets in protest. Well, the chance there is that clean air and clean water are an absolute right and uh, lots of people uh, shouting that there on the streets this week. Well, let's find out what life's been like uh, in a couple of the worst affected places in Khuzestan province, where, according to officials, the dust content of the air has recently hit 66 times permissible levels. Payman lives in Ahvaz, the province capital. For 10 days we have been breathing dust. You wake up in the morning, it's all fine, the nights are clear, but by midday visibility is so low, you can only see a few metres ahead of you. You get no warning on radio, kids go to school in the morning only to be sent home midday. They basically can't predict the weather for the next day. We are used to sandstorms, but not in winter. Looking outside the window, the garden looks like it's covered in snow, but it's not white, it's all brown and grey, pure dust. My wife is pregnant, but she doesn't leave the house and every hour she has to change her mask. Hundreds turned up outside the governor's office last week, but some got arrested. They can't even listen to our demands. But I don't think they know what to do, what advice to offer. Natural causes aside, there are too many dams built in this area and we have severe drought in Iran. If I meet those in charge, I would tell them, forget the nuclear program, pay attention to the environment. They have turned people's attention to the ongoing nuclear talks with the West and how important it is to have access to nuclear technology. But nuclear technology will not bring me health and security. It will not clean the environment nor create jobs. I'm not against progress, but at what cost? That was Payman, who lives in Ahvaz, and uh, this woman, who didn't want to give us her name, uh, spoke to us. She lives in Andy Meshk, a small town north of Ahvaz. You would think one's house is the safest place on earth, but not ours. In our house, it's not even safe to breathe. Believe me, I haven't left the house for a few days. My father is the only one going to work. Well, he has to. He works on a building site and gets paid daily. So if he doesn't go to work, he doesn't get paid and we need to eat. But you know, people in Khuzestan are used to hardship. And we don't really expect much from the central government. I tell you why. Being on the border with Iraq... We suffered the heaviest casualties during eight years of bloody war with Iraq. We paid a heavy price. Thousands fled and thousands died. To this day, we are still facing so many problems, poverty, unemployment, health problems, environmental problems. My list is just too long. But the war ended 20 years ago, and the central government has neglected us. To this day, they have failed to help us. Khuzestan is the wealthiest province in Iran. 
we have oil here, but that's all they care for. So people can scream as loud as they want, hoping President Rouhani will hear and rush to help them. But believe me, the help is not coming. The help will not come. The help hasn't come for 20 years. Well, it all sounds pretty difficult for local people. They're suffering those dust storms. But uh, many explanations have been given for the problem, including a recent drought, the drying and in some cases deliberate draining of the wetlands and the failure of neighbouring countries such as Iraq and Saudi Arabia to cover their soil with mulch, which helps to um, the earth to retain water. Whatever the cause, though, the perceived lack of action to tackle the problem has now become something of a headache for the government. And on Thursday, arrangements Iranian MPs demanded the resignation of the vice president and head of the environmental protection organization, Dr. Masuma Ebtakar. Well, a couple of hours ago, we managed to get through to her on a slightly scratchy line to Tehran. And uh, first of all, I asked her what her understanding was of the causes of this recent dust storm. The dust haze phenomena is an issue which is affecting, unfortunately, the North African and West Asian region. Part of this is attributed to the climate change effects. Also, we have in Iran a history of many dams on our major rivers. We also have an agriculture sector which uses up more than 93% of our water resources and it is not efficient as it should be. We also have the issue of urbanization like many other countries, industrialization. So these are all challenges that we're facing. The important thing is that we need to devise a strategy to respond to these challenges. For example, in Khuzestan, where the people are suffering most from the dust and the haze phenomena, We have a local program to combat desertification, to combat the sources, the hot spots of this dust phenomena. President Rouhani has spoken at length about this. He says that money's no object with regard to the current crisis and that something you know, has to be done. He, he's prepared to put the finances behind it. Your own department seems to be in the middle of all of this as the Department of the Environment. But how much actual power do you wield when you're faced with other powerful departments like, as you mentioned, the Ministry of Agriculture and indeed Energy? We are actually uh, coordinating the different organizations and different sectors. Yes, it's a multi-sectoral task. And the Department of the Environment now has a center where we are working on the dust haze phenomena with the Minister of Agriculture, with the Ministry of Water or Power. It's a multi-sectoral steering committee. And then there's a plan and a budget which will be finalized tomorrow in the cabinet where each sector very clearly knows what to do, what objectives to meet. But we also realize that everyone should know this, that it requires a long-term response. It requires a radical change in our agricultural, current agricultural practices should change. It requires a shift in the attitudes that we have towards protecting our natural resources, our rivers, our wetlands. So would that be a priority over nuclear energy, perhaps? I mean, that we heard on the streets this week with protesters saying clean air is a priority as much as nuclear energy. I mean, could we even see that happening? I think that nuclear energy is a priority because we're looking for energy mixes. Fossil fuels have always been a source of both pollution but also... CO2 emissions today. So we also think that in addition to solar energy, to wind energy on which we are investing currently, we need to look into nuclear energy as well. I know you've been under pressure in the Parliament for when you're going to visit the affected area, who's a stand. When will that happen? When are you going there? I'm going in a few days this week after the government adopts the budget. I have the deputies from the different sectors, including the agricultural sector, the water sector, the meteorological organization. They are all coming along with me to Khuzestan, and we're going to present the action plan, the roadmap that the government has adopted, and hopefully we'll start action as soon as possible. 
We started this sequence by hearing from people affected by this dust storm right now who can't leave the house, can't get to work. When can they hope to see a difference? Well, this is a long-term project. In the short term, we need resilient societies. They should be able to protect themselves. We need to provide the necessary means to protect them from the harm. The long-term project to manage the landscape to prevent the dust from forming in the country as well as at the regional level. It's a long-term issue. It's very difficult to determine a exact time frame, but we're sure that the people will work along with us. We have many strong NGOs, very keen environmentalists working here with us, scholars, university professors, and we also invite people at the international level to join us. And that was the vice president of Iran uh, there and the head of its environmental protection organization, Dr. Masuma Ebtakar. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kava Madani is a lecturer in environmental management at the Center of Environmental Policy at Imperial College here in London. Um, What did he make of what the vice president had to say there? coordination is a major issue in Iran. And although there is understanding their implementation of policies is the major challenge, Mm. it has a big social, political and economic cost. It's not easy to diversify the oil-based economy in the short run and create industries and jobs for people who would leave the agricultural sector. And as long as you don't have that alternative, people have to farm. And that means waste of water, waste of resources. Were you encouraged at all by her line of radical change in priorities? It is happening. I mean, you can see that the country is reacting. They have stopped building dams. Now there are lots of discussions about water transfers. Water transfers are not any better. And the other thing is public and the citizens normally don't appreciate movements toward the environment because the effects are not visible. I mean, if you want to do something for the environment, you see the result in 20 years, not tomorrow. Mm. And that's something that people... Politicians appreci- don't like yeah, that, do they? And p- people they appreciate things- a big building. I yeah. mean, they, they like a dam in their area. And, you know, the country which has gone through a war and also has been under international pressure has even had more thirst for development. All the environmental aspects have been overlooked and now we're seeing the consequences. And the consequences show themselves when there is an extreme event. And right now we have an extreme event. The level of the drought is nothing comparable to the droughts that Iran experienced 10, 20 years ago. But right now, a drought even smaller than the drought that we experienced earlier is creating massive problems for the country. Yeah, so the drive for development has been part of the problem then. But this concept of the different ministries being responsible for dam building, for road building, for energy, for agriculture, for health... Is there a sense that those departments are all working together in the same direction or is that part of the problem? Water environmental governance is always a challenging issue everywhere in the world. Iran is not an exception. But the current structure causes a lot of inefficiencies and unnecessary hierarchy in the system and also competition over resources, over policies. And I think the current structure does not give enough power to the Department of Environment to really intervene and stop development. At least in the last few decades, it has not been like that. And now we can see the consequences. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, people see this department as the responsible party and they ask questions. I mean, it's a Department of Environment whose head is the vice president and the president does not need parliament's approval for selecting the head of this department. So in theory, this should be a super powerful body of government. But in reality and in practice, looking at the culture in the region, I mean, environment has not been the top priority and has been some constraint to development at some times. But we have had a lack of understanding everywhere in the world, and including Iran, that development and environment are two different things. We've been focusing on this dust storm that's causing so many health problems at the moment. But clean air and air quality is a problem in Iran at the best of times, isn't it? Particularly in the cities. In fact, the world Health Organization recently of its top 10 most polluted cities in the world, four of them were in Iran. And that touches on the quality of the fuel people are using in in those cities. Can you explain that a bit more for us? 
Actually, I mean, the WHO ranking, which puts Ahwaz as the most polluted city of the world and then three other Iranian cities in the list, does not include any major city like Tehran with serious air pollution caused by fuel. But some of these cities have been ranked as the top polluted city because of the dust storms, indeed. And the other major issue is that recent sanctions have exacerbated the problem. The sanctions reduced the petroleum import by 75 percent, and the response was to produce things at home, which caused a lot of problems. And that was Dr. Kaveh Madani there of London's Imperial College. You're listening to the BBC World Service. This is Rebecca Kesby with NewsHour.